Welcome to today's webinar with Kenmare Resources PLC. Thanks, Alex. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time. And uh, welcome to Kenmare's H1 2021 presentation. Uh, just before we move into the presentation, for all those people who are not shareholders of Kenmare, maybe I could just give a, a very quick um, thumbnail overview of the company. Uh, Kenmare is uh, a mining company which is quoted on the main board in London. Uh, our activity, our operations, are the, uh, are the operation and further development of the MoMA titanium minerals mine in, uh, in northern Mozambique. And so this mine produces titanium feedstocks, which are the naturally occurring minerals of titanium and titanium dioxide which are in turn used to make titanium metal, but that represents only about five to 7% of total demand. Most titanium feedstocks are used to, to make titanium dioxide pigment, which is in then turn used to manufacture any manufactured item, which has either color or opacity from paper, plastics, fabrics, uh, through to inks, uh, food stuff, stuff, additives, basically anything that's manufactured and consequently, when we um, become a bit richer, we use more stuff and we use more titanium feedstock. Um, we are uh, quite a large mine. Uh, we represent about 8% of the world's supply of titanium feedstocks. Uh, and we have a co-product called Zircon and we represent about 4% of the world's supply of Zircon. We're the largest supplier into the world titanium feedstock merchant market into the world, sorry, into the ilmenite merchant market. Ilmenite is the actual mineral that we uh, that we have uh, the largest, um, the largest proportion of our ore body. So uh, with that, if I could turn to slide four, please, Jeremy, thank you very much. So we have um, a strategy which is based on three pillars, growth, margin, expansion, and shareholder returns. And I'm delighted to say that, that, our, that this strategy has resulted in us being able to deliver increased production and increased profitability, record production and record profitability uh, for the first half of 2021. Uh, we have implemented three growth projects over the last two years, two and a half years. And, uh, those have resulted in a 49% increase in production between H1 2021 and H1 2020, which has allowed our margin expand to coincidentally 49% from previously 33, and that has allowed us a triple or more than triple our interim dividend payout at 7.29 cents a share. Thanks, Jeremy. If I could turn on, please. So uh, just looking at this slide, um, I think the interesting thing is that while shipments are up and sales prices are up a bit, it's the combination of both of these plus uh, good discipline on costs has allowed EBITDA and profit after tax to expand quite significantly. Uh, it, this operation is relatively fixed price, it's a high proportion of fixed price and a small proportion of variable price. So as you increase your volumes, you have very significant effect. Uh, I'm also delighted to say that our first carbon emission reduction project that we've specifically developed is underway, and uh, that is expected to reduce our diesel consumption by 15%. It's a positive NPV project, um, so it's a, a as well as as being a good um, project for the for the planet it's a good project for our shareholders as well and we're we're very pleased with that and uh, the nataka pfs uh, that pfs stands for pre-feasibility study nataka is a new ore zone which we intend to move into in 2020 25 and so we're examining how best to mine nataka what is the most optimal way to mine it and to store our tailings etc cetera, etc cetera. and that that study is underway at the moment well before the uh, moment when we move in 2025. Thanks, Jim. Kemmer has been committed to the safety of both its employees and the local community members uh, really from the start and we believe we've demonstrated that and, um, and believe that 
it's understood through the communities. Uh, we have also been committed to run the, our project in a sustainable fashion, and uh, and we continue to do so. Just uh, as a, as a reminder or as a as a point of out of interest, Kenmare made a major investment uh, right at the start of our production to build a 170 kilometer long, 110 kilovolt overhead transmission line to connect the project with a sustainable power source. And, um, and, and it is that sustainable power source, which is a hydroelectric dam on the Kohoraba, on this, called Kohorabasa on the Zambezi River, which preside, provides more than 90% of the consumed power that use, is used by, by MoMA. Hence, in terms of, of carbon emissions per tonne of product, we consider ourselves to be a factor better than any of our peers. Um, we're doing the, the, the project I mentioned yesterday, or just on the previous slide, the RUBS project. Uh, we issued our first sustainability report um, this half. And if you have not the opportunity to see it, we're we're very proud of this report. And um, and if you got a chance to give it a quick look on the on our website, I think uh, you might you might find it interesting. Finally, we have a long term uh, sustainability strategy in development, which includes a carbon emission strategy, and that will be available and ready for our next annual report and sustainability report. We have uh, record safety performance. Um, we our safety uh, statistics for the for the first half of 2021 are that we have 0.14 lost time injuries per 200,000 man hours worked, which is a record for our company and is a result of dedicated focus uh, by management and personnel at the mining operation. And finally, COVID-19 has been a scourge on the planet and has been extremely difficult for Kenmore as well. However, I'm delighted to say that uh, we have worked with the Mozambican government and have acquired uh, vaccines for our employees, for their families, and for the local uh, community. And so the first round of those vaccinations is not complete. Uh, and we are in process of the second round of the vaccination. So when we're all double, when our team is all double and their families and the local community are all double vaxxed, um, I think that we will be approaching the end of uh, this um, terrible COVID chapter. Um, and so Jeremy, maybe you'd feel like giving uh, the guys a little run through the financial results. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, here's the, the P&L for the half. And as Michael says, it, it reflects the um, strong uplift that we've had in production and an increase in commodity prices as well, which has flowed through to the bottom line to drive an, an uplift in our EBITDA of nearly three times um, to $82.3 million, which is a record for the half. Uh, we did have a slight adverse variance um, with the mix of products, and that was uh, just a result of the timing of, of shipments. Um, we had fewer zircon concentrate and retail shipments as a proportion of our overall shipments than we normally would do, um, but we will see that um, reverse back in the second half of the year. Um, and so if you uh, look, at, look at the revenue bridge in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the benefit that we had from the increase in the volumes that we uh, produced and, and the uplift in the volume sold. Um, the uplift in, in the pricing with uh, average prices up 5%. And then the impact of that mix, which I said will reverse in, in the second half of the year. Um, despite all prices being up 5%, um, Ilmanite prices were actually up 18. Um, and therefore, again, the, the mix factor here means that we haven't had the, the full benefit of the um, uplift in all prices, but we will see that in the second half. But what we have seen is um, half on half since 2017, we've seen a very steady increase in the, the prices of, of all of our products. Um, and we expect that to continue into the second half of the year as pricing for Ilmenite has been increasing sequentially through Q1 and Q2 and into early Q3. 
uh, moving to the next slide, um, the uplift in production um, has, uh, has, has, has uh, not been matched in our uplift in sales. And therefore, we've seen a 22% reduction in our cost of, uh, of production, coming down from 183 in the first half of 2020 to 143 dollars per ton in 2021. Um, which is uh, in line with our guidance for the full year. Uh, we haven't seen the commensurate reduction in the cost of Ilmenite production, and that again flows back to those co-product revenues not coming through in the shipments in the first half, but will be there in the second half, um, where we expect that average cost of Ilmenite to drop further from the $113 per tonne that we achieved in the first half of 2021. And so if you look at our costs over time, um, with the movement of B and the increase in production we've seen in, in H1 2021, um, that cost per tonne is now trended um, back down from over 180 in the second half of 2020 um, to the $143 per tonne. Um, although there were some additional costs um, with regards to COVID and some HMC um, road haulage costs, um, that, that have led to a cost increase. We expect those COVID and HMC road haulage costs to be lower in the second half of the year. And uh, Michael will go into that when he talks about operations. Uh, the overnight cost per ton, as I previously mentioned, we expect to come down um, in, the, in the second half as those co-product sales increase and inventories normalize. And so what's that meant for the, uh, for the net debt position? Um, well, operating cash flow was $74 million. Uh, we spent 32 on property plants and equipment. This is the um, additional uh, capex uh, with regards to some of the WCPB um, moves, which uh, although may, the majority of the project was completed at the end of 2020, um, some of those uh, project costs are only invoiced at the beginning of this year. And so we've seen that, that cash outflow. And we've had some um, working capital changes, which have been negative to, to $42 million, um, with half of that coming from an increase in trade and receivables. Um, and this is basically as a result of us um, selling uh, more, more products and at a higher price, and, and therefore you'd expect that increase in receivables, but also that because we've had so much cash on the balance sheet and available to us, we haven't needed to factor our invoices to the same degree. Um, and that means that it's used up some, some working capital. Um, we don't expect that to um, continue in the second half and therefore with higher operating cash flow being generated from higher production and sales and the uh, benefit of the co-product sales and without those working capital changes, uh, you know, we should expect to see the, um, the free cash flow increase and, and therefore net debt coming down in the second half of the year. And so when you look at the balance sheet, um, Really, all I'd like to highlight here is that, you know, we maintain a, a strong balance sheet with um, $56.5 million of cash, and we have reduced the bank loans by about $20 million um, with a repayment of the uh, half of the revolving credit facility, $20 million was paid in H1, and uh, we expect um, with the trajectory that we're on to repay the second half of that revolving credit facility in the second half of 2021. Uh, and that brings me to, to dividends, uh, which as a result of uh, the increase in the profitability of the, of the company and um, the commitment to um, target a 25% payout ratio for 2021, which is up on our minimum dividend policy of 20%, um, has led to um, a dividend uh, being tripled um, for the interim up from 2.3 cents to 7.3 cents in the first half of 2021. Uh, the way we split the interim and final dividend is to target a one third interim, two thirds um, split, but the actual final dividend will be a balancing payment based on that 25% to reflect the, um, the profitability in the second half of the year, which as I've mentioned, uh, could potentially be higher than the first half. Um, and so with that, I'll hand back to Michael to talk through the operational overview. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we believe that we have always been committed to sustainability. However, we are enhancing that commitment 
I think everyone has been uh, watching fires and ravage through California, Greece, and just recently Southern France. Uh, it, so I, I think we're all very conscious of the increasing requirement on companies today and in the future to operate their, their operations in a way which will not contribute to further um, increase in temperature in the planet. And uh, so we're, we're working towards that as well as many other companies. We have a climate resili resilience and decarbonization strategy under development. Uh, I mentioned that we expect to have that available for our next sustainability report and our next annual report. Uh, we already are investing in, uh, in a rotary, rotating uninterruptible power supply, which will reduce our diesel consumption by 15% with a consequent similar level of reduction in carbon emissions. Our carbon emissions are already absolutely at a, at a very low level compared with our, our peer group. Um, we have planted about 120,000 trees over the last three years um, and three or four years, and uh, we will continue with that. So, so we are already working strongly to, um, to get towards a position where uh, we have uh, um, a very sustainable operation. We rehabilitate as we go. We don't leave a great scar on the planet. Uh, the, our method of mining doesn't require cyanide or sulfuric acid or, or any chemical addition. We simply mine it in the material by dredge, separate the titanium minerals that we want and replace the ore behind us. And consequently, we compensate farmers for the use of the land. Uh, and then about 18 months later, that land is back in active farming again. So if you go to an area that we have that we have mined and go to an area which we intend to mine, I don't think you would really recognize any difference between them. There might be slightly uh, slightly more gentle undulations in the uh, in the topography, but otherwise it'd be exactly the same. We are working strongly to increase our gender diversity. Uh, it, it's not the easiest business to attract a female workforce into, but our workforce is not, our female membership of the workforce is now more than 11% and, and is increasing. And uh, finally, we, we have a starting to notice an interesting phenomenon where customers are now asking us uh, what is the content of our of, of carbon emissions included in our in our product and in this we have a, a great advantage uh, compared with any of our of our peer group and um, and so we are not tracking that and the customers are tracking our performance i mentioned in terms of safety that we've got a record uh, a record performance that means that we have worked for 3.1 million hours without having a lost time injury uh, I think that's uh, that's a good performance. It doesn't happen by accident. It's careful assessment of the risk of every single task. It's uh, focused by by site management, senior management, and by every single person to take responsibility for his own and his colleagues' safety. Thanks, Jeremy. We could move on. So the, uh, we have recently implemented uh, uh, several projects. The last of which was the movement of our wet concentrator plant and a dredge from one area called Namalopi, Namalopi to a new ore zone called Pilavili, which is higher grade. we would finished mining Namalopi, and as you come to an end of any particular ore zone, you end up just taking the stuff that you didn't take previously, and it's, the grade tends to, to diminish. Uh, that was uh, that was quite a project. We had to lift this plant, which is weighs uh, somewhere around eight, 8 thousand tons, and uh, transported twenty three kilometers down a road that we constructed specially for the purpose, uh, and then replaced it in a new pond at Pilavili. Uh That has, that went well. We were happy to uh, to announce the completion of that project in the in September of last year, and. Uh, 
with uh, with the new plant in Pillabilly, uh, another plant which we have recently commissioned wet concentrator plant C and wet concentrator plant A working well. We have excavated record tons of, of ore in H1, approximately 20 million tons. And uh, we expect to continue at this rate through the second half of the year, which would leave us with a uh, 40 million ton or excavation for the total year, which would be uh, a record and you know is, is quite a significant mining project that that moves 40 million tons of ore. Thanks, Chairman. So just reviewing our production, uh, the after we mine our material, after we mine the ore, we put it through wet concentrated plants, which produce heavy mineral concentrate. So they separate the minerals from the gang material, which is then deposited uh, behind them. And uh, that heavy mineral concentrate is transported to a mineral separation plant where it's separated into final products. So we produce 798,000 tons of HMC, heavy mineral concentrate um, in H1. And from that, we made 559,000 tons of ilmenite, 28,200 tons of primary zircon, 4,200 tons of rutile, and 20,000 tons of concentrates, which we sell for further processing before they become into final products. And we shipped 594,000 tons of, of product. So this is, um, this, these are all good numbers as far as this project is concerned. And anyone who's been following us through the years will, will see that as a, as a pretty, pretty strong uh, uh, period of production. And we see that it should continue into the second half of the year. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I mentioned the wet concentrator plant B move. Um, that is the one that was completed during the year, um, during 2020. Uh, it includes, that whole project includes a pumping system that pumps heavy mineral concentrate back 22 kilometers to the uh, mineral separation plant. That pumping system has had some teething problems uh, some of the parts have been wearing out more rapidly than they're supposed to. And that has meant that we have had to continue trucking concentrate back through the, uh, through the first half of the year, which has contributed to slightly increased costs. Uh, we understand the issues associated with the, with the pumping system. Uh, we are making new uh, replacement parts, which are of higher quality than the existing ones. And won't wear out as rapidly, and we we believe that this will all get resolved reasonably shortly, and the utilizations for the pumping system will increase to the level that we need, and we can stop trucking. Uh, wet concentrated plant C, which we also completed last year, is a smaller wet concentrated plant, but also uh, a good one. It's performing above its expected levels. Uh, there were some small niggly points that needed to be resolved at the end of the of the uh, of the project. Those have been satisfactorily resolved, satisfactorily resolved, and we're closing out the project at this stage uh, and closing it out under budget. And finally, the rotary uninterruptible and uninterruptible power supply units. Uh, that project is underway and uh, it will cost us about $18 million, but will be a positive NPV project, providing greater stability for the operation of mineral separation plant and therefore allowing us to produce more product and reducing the, the, the usage of diesel, uh, which is where we get our savings. Thanks. Jeremy. So in 2025, we are going to move wet concentrator plant A to a new mining area called Nataka. So it's necessary for us to take a, a, take a, a, a very close look at the type of ore body that we're going to be mining to understand in great detail, uh, both the grades, but the mineability 
and, uh, and all other aspects associated with this ore body. And we have been working hard to do that over the last while with uh, geotechnical testing, uh, testing of hydrological, uh, uh, the hydrology associated with the water model around the ore body, um, and also how we will mine it. We will mine it. And one of the possibilities is that we will mine by dredging, but use supplemental hydro mining units. And hydro mining is really high pressure hosing of the uh, of the ore down towards the dredges, which makes the dredges work more efficiently. And uh, we have done a test that tests the, the results that those that test has been very positive. And um, we will do more test work before we complete PFS, which is due for completion uh, in the middle of 2022. Our ore body is very large. We expect to continue to mine uh, with the resources that we have identified already by drilling for, for about 100 years, somewhat more than 100 years. So therefore, it behoves us to, um, to get to really optimize our style of mining because they, uh, th this will continue to, to pay us and provide returns for our shareholders for the long term. And you can see in the chart on the bottom right hand side of that screen, that is a plot of them, the output from the mine plan through until 2049. Uh, which is a long time. Um, Jeremy, do you want to give uh, the ladies and gentlemen a, a quick review on the market and then we'll sort of make some closing comments? Absolutely. So just to remind everyone, um, Ilmenite is our, is our primary um, product in terms of revenues, typically around sort of two thirds to 70% to of, our, of our revenues, um, with the majority of the balance um, coming from Zerfun. Um, and the titanium feedstocks, uh, about 5% of them go into welding rods, so primarily used things like shipbuilding, uh, and 5% goes into, uh, into titanium metal, which is used in the aerospace industry um, and for medical applications. And then 90% is used in paints, pigments and plastics. Um, and so that's, that's been something which has um, been actually very strong through the COVID period. Um, Lots of people have been painting their houses at home and, and consuming paint um, in that manner. And that's led to a very robust market for us um, with all of our product prices increasing. Um, Zircon tends to be used uh, more in the ceramics industry and, and refractories. And similarly, as, as people have been doing work on their homes, there's been, um, been demand for Zircon and, and Zircon tiles. Um, and, and on top of that, there have been some constraints on um, supply from a number of different producers around the world and um, partly because of uh, interruptions to production for social and other reasons but also because uh, a lot of mines are towards the end of their lives and reducing production um, as a result of that and uh, as I mentioned previously those those strong prices have continued into Q3 uh, we tend to find that our Ilmenite price slightly lags the spot market uh, there's a couple of reasons for that one is that uh, we sell a lot of our volumes um, to long-term off-takers uh, who may have three or five-year volume off-takes uh, with six monthly price resets. And so as the market moves up, um, our contract pricing um, moves up every, every six months. But the sales to China, um, which are shown on the next slide, on slide 23, you can see represent about 40% of our sales of Ilmenite. And the majority of those sales to China are done on a, on a spot basis. So we have a blend of, of, of contracts. Um, in China specifically, it's really where there's been the growth in the pigment market, where new pigment plants have been built and titanium sponge production, which is um, an intermediate product for producing titanium metal um, in the main. Uh, both of those markets have been growing strongly in China and our feedstocks are Ilmenite specifically because not all Ilmenites are equal, um, are, are very well suited to, the, to, those, to those growth markets. Um, there's also been some specific constraints um, in the high grade uh, feedstock market as a result of um, some production being shuttered in South Africa. Um, and therefore our feedstock feed, uh, is very suitable 
um, for, for upgrading to, to replace a, a portion of that, of that supply that hasn't been there. Um, and uh, you know, as a result of this, we saw uplift in Q1 and Q2 and, and flowing into Q3 in terms of pricing. Um, and so sort of to summarize the outlook, um, throughout the value chain, so we have Ilmenite, which then gets turned um, into uh, sort of an intermediate titanium slag product, which then goes to pigment, which then ends up in paint formulation, which might then end up as, as DIY paint or, um, you know, to paint, to paint cars or, or, or um, other white goods. Um, there's quite a long value chain there, but throughout that value chain, we see normal or low levels of, of inventory, which we think is very supportive for um, the market going forwards. And the additional production that we've produced, um, whilst it's up dramatically from the levels we were producing last year, that's been absorbed into the market very well, and there's still a healthy amount of, of demand for all of our, all of our products. Um, on the Zircon front, uh, the market has been weaker in the last couple of years, uh, but that has um, tightened substantially with both demands coming up but also some supply shortages um, and inventories are very low on the Zircon front. And, and therefore, you know, we expect to see some um, significant increases and we have been seeing some significant increases on the Zircon pricing front in the third quarter. And uh, we expect that to feed through into higher realizations for us in the second half of the year, benefited also by a higher volume of those co-product sales as that mix returns to normal. Um, and so with that, I'll pass back to Michael to make some concluding remarks. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, the, uh, it has been an objective of our strategy to become our first quartile margin producer in the revenue to cost curve for this industry. Uh, we we uh, are now in a position where the projects which have been implemented over the last couple of years and the improvements in utilization and organizational systems that we have put in place in the at the mine are 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 propelling us to that first quartile position and this will give us increased cash flow stability and allow us to maintain positive cash flow throughout the commodity cycle it's a significant advantage for our stakeholders, for our shareholders, if we achieve and maintain this position. And we believe we will, and we believe we will maintain it. And that therefore, you know, we will make better margins during periods of um, scarce commodity situation. And then as the market, as the market cycle, the commodity cycle occurs and prices cycle downwards as will inevitably happen at some time in the future we will maintain positive cash flows thanks jeremy if you could move forward uh, our strategy has been based on the three pillars that we explained uh, earlier on and the growth projects associated that uh, with that have been low capital intensity projects which have been very specifically designed to fill unused existing installed capacity. So we had more capacity in our mineral separation plan. So therefore we had, all we had to do was create wet concentrate plant C and, and fill that additional capacity. Um, and, uh, and in many other instances, we, we've made similar investments to, to ensure that the installed capacity is operating at its maximum level throughout the system. That has allowed our margins expand and that has allowed us increase our shareholders returns uh, today, but also for the future. And as I mentioned, we have a, a very long term project, so we can expect to see good returns for our shareholders and our stakeholders generally well into the future. So thanks very much, Alex. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So we're happy to answer any questions. Jeremy and Michael, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. We are now going to go to questions. We've had a couple, as I said, come in ahead of time. And if you do want to ask a question, please just type it into the uh, Q&A box. The first question sort of covers, um, and there have been a number of questions on this, so I'll try and group them together about product pricing. The first question is, what was the realized sales price for Ormonite in the first half? 
And then the second question related to that, in the last three to four months, all of the reported spot ilmenite prices mentioned in the media have been within the range 280 to $380 a tonne. Do you think that Ken Mayer will be able to achieve realized sales prices higher than $300 a tonne in the next six months? So it, it, with regard to the first one, I think 254 was the realized um, sales price for Ilmalite in H1. Um, and um, so it's easy to look at a Bloomberg screen and get a spot price. And um, those prices, if they're coming from, from China, are prices for delivered main port China, while the prices that that we quote are quite are prices uh, under the term free on board. So they mean loaded at our jetty into customer vessels. So between us and Mainport China, there is a shipping and shipping agent and insurance cost, CIF, and uh, carriage insurance and freight. And, um, and the freight cost between MoMA and Mainport China at the moment is about $60. So um, what I would say to the questioner is that we get very good prices for our Ilmenite. We are probably the most expensive Ilmenite for any particular quality that, that is on the market. And uh, we, we leave no additional money on the table. So what we get is what the market is, is, is available to, to pay. And what, what you see on a, on a Bloomberg screen should be taken as an indication of trend rather than specifically say, thinking that this is the absolute price that we could get. Uh, another point about that is that because we agree a shipment's price uh, uh, and they agree with our customer, we then conclude documentation, and then they have to provide letters of credit, and then we have to, to, to find a shipping slot, a loading slot, and get a vessel, and then ship that to China, that by the time that arrives in China, it's maybe two, two and a half months after we conclude the, um, the um, uh, price negotiation. And so if a person then looks at the price, the instantaneous price in China compared with the price that we have achieved, and you're in an upward price environment, whether it be a discrepancy, and the discrepancy is caused by A, the freight, and B, the timing. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. That was a very clear explanation of the, of the price differences and the prices you achieve. We've had four questions on the next topic, and I'm going to group these all together. And they're really asking for an update on the political um, and security situation in northern Mozambique and whether that's had uh, any impact on your operations and how you view uh, the situation evolving over the coming six months. So look, firstly, uh, we'd like to say that, uh, that we are aware of the tragedy that has unfolded in northern Cabo Delgado um, in, in the last couple of years. It's, you know, for ordinary citizens living in that area, it's been an enormous travesty and tra tragedy, um, and we don't make light of it. Um, however, as far as Kenmer and Kenmer's operations, 70, 800 kilometers south of there is concerned, it has not had an effect, an, an effect other than it causes our investors concerns and, um, and difficulties. How the, how the project has, or how, how the situation has evolved over the last while is interesting. Uh, the Mozambican government signed an agreement with SADAC, which is South African uh, development nation development uh, cooperation group and um, the Rwandan army have arrived in Cabo Delgado and the Rwandans have um, effectively brought the fight to the rebels they have uh, um, pushed them back uh, along um, through a broad swath of the country the Rwandans have retaken the, the port town of Masimba de Praia 
and uh, and then are pushing them further back into the area close to the Tanzanian border. So militarily, the, the insurgents have uh, suffered a major blow over the last period. Um, and their, the situation is ripe, not right now for the government to do the right thing and address the underlying you know, uh, facilitation of the uh, insurrection, which is lack of economic development, lack of economic opportunity, uh, lack of education, lack of government services, and the government has to step in now and, and start to answer those issues. But over the last month, the situation has improved dramatically. Thank you. Again, another couple of questions linked together here is about uh, uh, the strength of the uh, balance sheet and capital allocation. You should be debt free in full year 2022. Um, in press reports, you signal that M&A is not on the agenda. Can you comment on your capital allocation priorities beyond 2021? Jeremy, do you like to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, we've outlined obviously uh, a dividend policy that we uh, that we need to meet, um, and also we need to take into account the fact, as Michael talked about, the requirements for um, some capital expenditure. So we've got the RUPS project, which is both a carbon reduction, but also um, important in maintaining the stability of our power supply. Um, so we think that's an, an MPV positive project on some pretty um, conservative assumptions, but also we need to think about um, the way in which our um, project for the move from the tapper is going to happen. So that's a project which we're doing the PFS on, which will be out next year. It will give us an indication of cost, but um, people should think about it as being in the same ballpark as the move of WCPB, which ends up costing $127 million. And so whilst commodity prices are high now, and we think there's lots of reasons why they should um, maintain at high levels in the next coming years, um, we can't rely on that. And so we need to make sure that we have um, some capital available to, to pay for that project for the move of A, because it isn't something um, which is a, um, a discretionary project. Uh, the move of A has to happen as we mine the ore in Namalopi and need to move to the TACA. Um, and so these things are all taken in, in, in balance. Um, for the first half of this year, um, we haven't reduced our, our net debt. Um, as you say, and as consensus numbers look, the, that looks like it's happened at some point next year. Um, and if we don't have a better use for the cash um, and we don't think that we need it, then we will look to return that to shareholders. And that might come in the form of a, of a special dividend or it might come in the form of a share buyback. Um, or, uh, or it could come in increased um, base dividend, but we are cautious that uh, we don't want to increase our standard payout ratio too much at a point in which um, the commodity prices are, are very high. Uh, and you know, we think that that four times dividend cover is something which is, is very valuable too, um, and hope that shareholders are pleased with the three times uplift in the dividends that we'll um, hopefully be delivering this year. Uh, anything on that, Michael, to add? No, I fully agree with everything you said there, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. A, a linked question. We've had a couple of people congratulating on the dividend increase, but also a couple of people saying it would be nice to have uh, some return of capital through uh, share buybacks. So looks uh, sort of split from the investors on this call. wondered if you could just comment on the, the balance of your, or how you think about share buybacks versus um, the dividends. Yeah, look, uh, we always, um, consider the potential for share buybacks. And that's always something which is um, discussed by the board as well. Um, and when we're doing that, we look at the equivalent rate of return and that equivalent rate of return of a share buyback versus a normal dividend um, is going to be uh, something which changes with the share price at the point in time. Um, and it also changes um, with our projections of what future profitability might be. Um, and so we've got our base dividend policy um, as we go forwards, we'll continue to weigh up uh, whether a buyback is the right thing um, to do or not for the business as we see the value being generated effectively. Okay, thank you. Nice comment here. Delighted to hear your reinforced commitment to sustainability. However, I've not heard mention of when you plan to reach carbon net zero. Uh, surely setting this target is crucial to the development of your climate resilience strategy. 
Yeah, um, we are we are developing um, a climate um, strategy at the moment, and so the the selection of a target requires an understanding of how we need to, what we need to do to achieve that target and how we can how we can achieve that target. So uh, I don't think we can turn around and just say, oh, well, look, we're going to get to net zero without knowing how we're going to get to net zero. And so that's where the work is under, that's the work that is underway at the moment. And um, hopefully we will be able to come out with a very, uh, with a very solid strategy that pleases, um, pleases our stakeholders. Um, but, it, it has to be grounded in some form of reality, and uh, we need to uh, to understand how we can technically achieve what we commit to achieve. Yeah, uh, we've just recently hired a new sustainability man uh, manager. Sorry, um, Anna Brog. She joined us from Tullo uh, actually only about a month ago, I think. So um, she's busy working on developing that plan, and we plan to um, announce that, as Michael said earlier, with our second sustainability report and the annual report next year. So there's a lot of work going into that, not simply by Anna, but by lots of consultants, lots of, of technology specialists. So we have to be able to, to figure out how we can do it. Got a question here specifically on the accounts. Could you comment on invoice factoring? How much are you still utilizing? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we're using, as I mentioned earlier, less invoice factoring than we have done um, previously, um, but we are still using some form of invoice factoring, which really relates to our 40% of Ilmenite sales to China. Um, when those sales take place, they're done on a letter of credit um, basis, so we're not taking the underlying credit risk on the Chinese um, uh, parties, counterparties, um, and so there are some costs that are associated uh, with that. Um, I mean, if you look currently, our um, days of sale of our receivables um, based on an annualized revenue um, is probably about 30 days and our credit terms are typically longer than that. So there is um, a, a bit of, um, of that benefiting um, from those um, sales into China and we're continually sort of reviewing that and trying to find the, uh, the best balance. Obviously, we don't want too much money tied up in receivables, but equally when we're strong, um, with, a, with a good cash balance, um, we don't need to be paying um, high fees for those. So um, it's something that's constantly monitored and reviewed by uh, Tony and CFA. Got a couple of questions uh, to go through. Um, one of them is about the valuation and saying that the company looks very, very good value relative to peers. Um, what is management doing, and what can management doing do to uh, uh, narrow the gap between the valuation and uh, and that of your peers? Well, I'm um, pleased to say that the, the valuation gap is less than it was six months ago with the, um, the share price being higher. But uh, obviously, it's about continuing to deliver on what we said we were going to do, deliver to our guidance, um, you know, deliver the, the cash flows that we have been doing and, um, you know, doing events like this and getting out to speak to as many people as possible. Unfortunately, um, you know, Ken Mayer doesn't sit in the FTSE 250 um, uh, and therefore, you know, we're not in a meaningful way in any indices and, and therefore, you know, we need to try and convince um, investors of, of the um, value that we believe that we have, um, both in terms of the size of, of the Kenma deposit, but also the scale and the quality being 100 years like of mine um, and the first quartile production. And, and as Michael was alluding to earlier, um, more and more in terms of the benefits that we think our customers get um, from from buying our product in that you know the low carbon intensity, which is something which we're looking to try and outline and define more. Great, thank you. And one last question, um, specifically here on capex, can you provide some capex guidance to twenty one and twenty two? Uh, twenty one, we've given capex guidance of eighty five million dollars um, for twenty twenty two. Um, it will be the majority of it will be sustaining capital, which is um, between 25 and 30 million dollars a year. Um, it, it's, it can be slightly lumpy depending on what's going on, and we'll give full guidance for that in January. Uh, and there's also likely to be some costs in 2022 um, with regards to the ongoing studies from the TACA. I think the total studies 
for an attacker through 2021 and 2022 are about $10 million. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Thank you for answering those questions uh, so clearly. That comes to the end of today's webinar with uh, Kemo Resources. I uh, just want to remind you of a couple of things. As you leave today, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. If you wouldn't mind spending a couple of minutes completing that and giving some feedback, that would be very much um, appreciated. And just to advise you of a couple of webinars uh, coming up now in September. On the 16th, we have Capita PLC. And on the 23rd, we have Crossword Cybersecurity. If you want to hear about any uh, further details on those two webinars, please visit the Yellowstone Advisory website www.yellowstoneadvisory.com.